Most of us are familiar with the beautiful custom of dipping apples in honey at this time of year. And as we dip the apple in honey, we say a bracha, and we wish for each other a shana tova imetuka kedvash. The hope that the coming year will be as sweet as the honey. Now, a lesser known custom, which has become increasingly popular and more widespread in recent years, is of Iraqi origin, and one that my wife, whose family is from Baghdad, introduced to me. Iraq was once home to a prosperous, proud, and prominent Jewish community. Dating back over 2,600 years, it was a center of great learning and where the Talmud was created and written. And so every Rosh Hashanah in our home, we observe the practice of the Jews of Iraq, and we say blessings over various fruits and vegetables, each one being a pun on the Hebrew word for that particular piece of fruit or food. So for example, we hold up a date, which in Hebrew is Tamar, and then we say Shitamu Sonenu, which means, with the word, with the Tav sound in there, may our enemies perish. Then we eat a leek, which in Hebrew is Karat, and we say Shiyikartu Kom Vakshe Ra'atenu, which means may all those who seek evil against us be Karat, may they be cut off. For beets, which is Selik, we say, may all of our enemies be driven away. There are a few more, but I think you get the picture. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. There are some positive blessings in there, <laughs> such as when we eat the seeds of the pomegranate and express the hope that our lives will be as filled with mitzvot as the pomegranate is filled with seeds. And overall, the pattern and the theme, however, of a number of the blessings is a plea that God will annul the plans of those who seek to destroy us. I don't know the history or the origin of this custom, nor how long has it been around. The truth is, though, expressing the hope that enemies who plot to harm Jews will fail in their efforts could probably be said by almost any Jewish community, almost anywhere in the world, at pretty much any time in our history. Regardless of when the custom began, I'm certain and confident of one thing. I doubt that there is very much debate, dissension, or disagreement among them over how to define and determine who their enemies were. But unfortunately today, it seems we Jews are so divided, we cannot even agree on what constitutes anti-Semitism. The left only recognizes anti-Semitism when it emanates from the right, and the right only sees it when it comes from the left. This lack of unity on this most basic issue is why Natan Sharansky, on his most recent visit to the United States earlier this summer, asked me to convene a small group of diverse Jewish leaders here in Washington to see if we could reach any agreement about the eternal, external, existential threats facing the Jewish people. In response to the rise in anti-Semitism around the globe, in 2016, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance recognized that, quote, in order to begin to address the problem of anti-Semitism, there must be clarity, first, about what anti-Semitism is. And so they set out to build an international consensus to come up with a working definition that diverse parties could agree upon. They undertook the project to give policymakers around the world the tools to be able to identify the problem. And so after an arduous process entailing much vetting and discussion, what they came up with has met widespread acceptance, having been adopted by over 30 nations, including the United States, the European Union, a number of NGOs, academic institutions and local governments, and municipalities around the world. However, since it cites as an example of anti-Semitism, quote, drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis, and there's another clause that states that, quote, denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination by claiming that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor, end quote, because of those two clauses, not everyone is willing to embrace and accept this carefully crafted document. Now, the opposition has come 
not just from those who we would expect to oppose it, such as the Arab League or the 57 members of the Organization of Islamic States or Nazi sympathizers. Objecting to it becoming official policy of the United States and opposing it being codified into US law is a coalition of groups known as the Progressive Jewish Alliance, consisting of Americans for Peace Now, J Street, the New Israel Fund, Trua, and a few other groups claiming to represent Jewish values. Although the IRA definition explicitly states that, quote, criticism of Israel, similar to that of any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. Nevertheless, this alliance of progressive Jewish groups issued a statement that they were concerned that adoption of the doctrine would undermine freedom of expression because it may encourage criticism of Israel to be suppressed. You heard correctly. Jewish groups who claim to support Israel feel compelled to protect the rights, not of Israel, but of Israel's critics. If there's any one thing that we don't have to worry about is that there isn't enough criticism of Israel or that debate over Israel's policies might somehow be stifled and lessened. That's our concern. Rejecting the IRA definition is comparable to a person drowning in the ocean, refusing to accept a life preserver because they don't like the small print on the inside li lining of the flotation device. Something is happening in the Jewish world today, and it is troubling, deeply troubling. In 1975, the late Israeli diplomat Abba Ibn wrote in a column in the New York Times that hatred of Israel and the Jewish people are actually one and the same. Almost 50 years ago, he pointed out that the singling out of the Jewish state for the kind of criticism not leveled at other nations is a convenient way for those with contempt for Jews to dodge the charge of anti-Semitism. While they may claim to object to a particular policy or leader, in reality, what they really object to is Israel's right to exist. This is what he wrote. Quote, there's no difference whatever between anti-Semitism and the denial of Israel's statehood. Classical anti-Semitism denies the equal right of Jews as citizens within a society. Anti-Zionism denies the equal rights of the Jewish people, its lawful sovereignty within the community of nations. The common principle in the two cases is discrimination against Jews, end quote. Or to put it a different way, making obsessive, excessive criticism that focuses almost exclusively on Israel and claiming you're, anti you're not anti-Semitic, just anti-Zionist, for me is kind of like trying to explain the difference between Lox and Nova. I don't need either one. For 11 days in May, Israel was bombarded by 4,300 rockets launched by Hamas into civilian areas and although Israel responded to the indiscriminate launching of a barrage of rockets with precision to destroy specific Hamas targets who were launching them while striving to avoid civilian casualties, Israel was the one that was accused of a disproportionate response. If anything was disproportionate, it was the intense vitriolic hyperbolic criticism leveled against Israel in social media. That's what was disproportionate. We have become somewhat inoculated and are not surprised that the International Criminal Court and the United Nations, as well as the Yale University Student Council, California Teachers Union, NYU professors, and a list of others have come out against Israel. We still are outraged and appalled, but we've become somewhat used to and almost immune to these criticisms from these quarters. In a post-Holocaust world where blatant hatred of Jews is intolerable and unfashionable among certain quarters, I can understand why those who hate Jews would wish to qualify their anti-Semitism and, and disguise their antipathy towards Jews in the guise of anti-Zionism and claim they have nothing against Jews, only against Israel's policies. But for Jews, for Jews to be so publicly focused and critici publicly criticizing Israel, while ignoring other human rights abuses around the world is inexcusable. 
when 100 rabbinic students in non-Orthodox seminaries have the chutzpah to sign a petition objecting to Israel taking measures to defend and protect its citizens and accuse Israel of violent suppression of human rights, as they did this summer, something is terribly wrong. To make the false claim, as they do in their letter, that, quote, Israel's actions constitute an intentional removal of Palestinians shows naivete and a superficial, misguided understanding of the conflict. Ignoring Hamas's genocidal intentions, as stated in their charter, these would-be rabbis probably believe the Hamas propaganda, that the attack was prompted by a seizure of Palestinian property, but which in reality is actually much closer to a landlord-tenant dispute, rent dispute, being adjudicated in one of the fairest judicial systems in the world, and indisputably, certainly, the fairest in the entire Middle East. For future leaders of Jewish communities to express a litany of complaints against Israel for defending its people while rockets were still falling without making a single reference to Hamas's provocations is unprecedented and inexcusable and troubling. We have a problem. We have a problem. And it's not just due to threats from our traditional enemies. The intent of those who hurl slanders and libel Israel by accusing it of apartheid, genocide, and ethnic cleansing is to portray it in a way that makes Israel seem morally repugnant, thereby rendering defense of its people seem unwarranted, unwarranted and unjustifiable in order to harp, hamper its ability to defend its people. And Jews should not adopt the positions or language of those who undermine Israel's legitimacy. How dare they spread the malicious lies of those who denigrate our people and despise our people. When our fellow Jews are under attack, our role is to be character witnesses on their behalf, not to join in the fray. As Gilderoy Troy wrote, these charges are, quote, inaccurate and insulting, counterproductive and self-destructive. It hardens hearts and polarizes positions. And in demonizing the Jewish state, it encourages hooligans who target the Jews living in that state and the Jews living elsewhere, too. End quote. The 11-day conflict between Israel and Hamas unleashed a torrent of cries of death to the Jews and attacks on Jews, Jewish institutions, and even just places of business owned by or associated with Jews around the world. Synagogues throughout the world were targets of anti-Semitic acts of desecration, because those who hate Israel don't make that distinction between Jews and the Jewish state. Think about it. When Russia attacked and invaded Ukraine, there were no calls for violence at Russian Orthodox churches. There was no need for increased security at their houses of worship. But there were in synagogues at this time. Anti-Semitism takes many forms, not just blatant hateful comments and acts. It can be more subtle, such as downplaying or denying its existence. Last May, a Stanford University town hall was doom-bombed with racist and anti-Semitic messages and images. They were equal opportunity offenders, as they used both the N-word and swastikas. But so as not to overshadow the anti-black racism of what happened, the report of the university's diversity committee omitted reference to the anti-Semitic aspects of the incident and left it out entirely in their report. The time has come for us to demand greater accountability from colleges. A high percentage of Jews attend universities. Other than your home, it's probably the largest single expense a family has. You have a right, a right to demand that our children, that your children, not be subjected to visual or verbal assaults or prejudice when they go to college. Demand that institutions of higher education take measures to ensure that Jewish students are not bullied intimidated or ostracized for joining Jewish organizations, for supporting Israel, or just for being Jewish. If ever there was a time for clarity and Jewish unity, a time to stand with your fellow Jews in the face of such an outpouring of blatant anti-Semitism and danger, it is now. Yet sadly, some among us have chosen not to stand with our people. Motivated by attacks around the world, Alicia Wiesel, son of Elie Wiesel, sought to galvanize a uni unified Jewish response 
to the rising tide of anti-Semitism with a rally here in Washington this summer called No Fear. Conscious efforts, he made conscious efforts, to be as inclusive as possible, to make the tent as big as possible, to invite groups from the right and the left to be sponsors. Because the rally in solidarity with the Jewish people referred to the rights of Jews in both the United States and Israel to exist in peace and security, a number of organizations which have the word Jewish in their name, who purport to speak on behalf of Jews, for the most part, the very same ones I mentioned a few minutes ago who objected to the definition of anti-Semitism, they all declined to participate or support because the platform referred to Israel and the right of Jews to live in peace there. Lest anyone question or think I'm not aware of it, I recognize that Israel is not perfect, nor is it above criticism. But I want you to know, I don't love Israel because it is perfect, nor does Israel need to be perfect for me to love her. A story is told about a king who commissioned a painter to paint a portrait of him. It puts it in perspective. Upon meeting him for the first time, the artist said, your majesty, I see that you have scars from childhood acne on your face, and I want to be sure that you won't be upset if I capture the blemishes, since my style is realistic and I paint what I see. The king replied, you're welcome to include the blemishes. I only ask that you not neglect to paint my face. I don't love Israel because it has no blemishes, but because it's Israel. In the early 20th century, a member of the House of Lords of Great Britain asked Zionist leader Chaim Weizmann when he was working for the establishment of the State of Israel, why do you Jews insist on Palestine when there's so many undeveloped countries you could settle in more conveniently? And the Zionist leader, future president of Israel, replied, that's like asking me why you drove 20 miles to visit your mother last Sunday when there's so many other nice old ladies living on your street. <laughs> more than our historical ties to Israel, to the land, the Israel I know and love, and that you know and love, is the country that has risen out of the ashes of the Holocaust. It's the one place in the world where someone from Poland and from Yemen can live together and have a common heritage, language, and destiny. It's a nation that rushes to send humanitarian aid halfway around the world the moment that, does, that disaster strikes wherever it may be. It's the people who, while fighting for its survival defiantly, resist the temptation to succumb to the repression of freedom and of democracy, as is the case in the countries surrounding it. It's the country that rescues those rejected by every other nation, and despite economic problems of its own, doesn't hesitate for a moment to absorb millions of poor Jews from the Soviet Union, or to airlift tens of thousands of black Jews out of Africa in order to bring them home to Israel and the Jewish people. It is the startup nation who shares willingly its medical and technological discoveries with the world. The place where the heads of both Pfizer and Moderna, who came up with the vaccine to co combat COVID-19, both studied. I could go on. For wherever we have lived, whether in Israel or Iraq, not just in the realm of Jewish life, but in cultural, financial, academic, and so many other areas, Jews have contributed disproportionately to better the lot, not just of Jews, but for all people. That's the story we need to tell. That's what we need to be proud of. So why do we say it? Well, there's a midrash about an old man who spends his days prowling the streets of Sodom and Gomorrah, places filled with sin, crying out against the abuses, the depravity, the immorality that was so pervasive and that he saw all around him. And as he was going up and down the street, shouting out against what he saw, a man came up to him one day and said to him, old man, don't you realize there's no way you will ever be able to change these people? And he answered, long ago I gave up hope of changing them. Now I speak out against the injustice and immorality to be sure they will not change me. So let us speak out. Let us speak out to those who denounce Israel so loudly, whether it's a non-Jew or a Jew that they not change us or diminish our sense of unity, our sense of love for our people. 
At the end of the meeting I mentioned earlier with Natan Sharansky, I told the diverse group that was assembled, when we're united, we can do amazing things. We came together and succeeded in freeing Soviet Jews, which ultimately led to the downfall of the Iron Curtain. And then, putting my hand on Natan Sharansky's shoulder, who was sitting next to me, I said, and we got this guy out of solitary confinement in the Soviet Gulag. In one of his many conversations, when making the case for the establishment of the State of Israel in its ancient homeland, Weitzman asked British Foreign Secretary Lord Balfour, if you were offered Paris instead of London, would you take it? And Balfour replied, but London is ours, to which Weitzman responded, and Jerusalem was ours when London was still just a marsh. God tells Abraham in the book of, of, of Genesis, which we soon will be reading, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. Let us hope that this will soon come to pass, that all on earth, including ourselves and our fellow Jews, all our fellow Jews, will recognize the blessing of what it means to be a Jew in the 21st century. Let us hope that we live to see the day when the blessings we recite over fruits will no longer be the prayer that the plots of our enemies will be annulled. But let us hope that we one day will be able to say just blessings, asking that we be fruitful. Blessings that our merits and mitzvot shall be multiplied like the seeds of the pomegranate, and that we shall know and live in peace, and the words of the prophet shall come to pass, and none shall live in fear. So may it be thy will, and let us say, Amen.